This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, David Wigwolf, who I've known for a long time now, I guess, since 2006, uh, when he was at Frankfurt University. He worked for nearly 25 years at Frankfurt University in Germany uh, for the Fundmünzen der Antike project of the Mainzer Academy der Wissenschaften. And since 2008, he numismatist at the Romish Germanische Commission of the uh, Deutsches Archaeologisches Institut in Frankfurt. Uh, and so, yeah, I don't think I need to say anything else. With that, I'll hand it over to David. Thank you very much, Nathan. And uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's evening here, but I think most of you it's afternoon. So. I'm now, and thank you very much for the invitation to to talk a little about a bit about um, the work I do. Um, I work mainly on ancient numismatics from Western Europe, but one of my particular interests is the interaction between the Mediterranean world and the various peoples who live um, up north. And today, I'd like to look at the interaction with two two groups. Um, I'm going to start with the Germans during the Roman Empire and then go on to look at the Celts in the period before the Roman Empire. And uh, and then, well, let's move on to the oh, get this running on to the next slide. Yeah. So, as I say, start with the Germans, move on to the Celts. And the sort of questions I'd like to look at here are what are the interactions with the Mediterranean world that led to the Celts and Germans? learning about coins and their use. How did they then react to this introduction to coinage? For example, did they mint their own coins? And if so, how did their coinage develop? And an interesting point is, what's the function of coins in their um, environment? How did they actually use coins? What were they for? And then I'll close with a very brief comparison of differences, similarities between the two. So where are we going to be starting? I'm going to start with the Germans first. Um, I like to use the Latin word Germani um, because that's how the Romans described them. Germans is kind of a bit, um, yeah, it's obviously it's politically um, nuanced. So I'd like, I prefer to use the word Germani. And the area I'm looking at is the Barbaricum. So the area to the north of the Roman Empire spreading from the North Sea coast um, through to the Ukraine. And I should add that the barbaricum is a word the Romans used to describe this um, territory. So let's start by looking very briefly, for example, are there a lot of Roman coins outside the Roman Empire? And this is a map of fine spots from my database of northern um, Germany, I've got fine spots where Roman coins are found, and we can see there are a lot of them. And the red line down here, I'm just tracing with the mouse, is um, that's the frontier of the Roman Empire um, between the mid first century and the mid third century AD. So we can see there's a lot of coinage moving out of the empire. Um, I've marked outside on the map because we're going to have a look at that in a minute. Um, if I then start to look at what those coins are outside the empire, um, here an example of the federal state of mecklenburg vorpommern up on the Baltic coast. And if we look at the coins, they're divided here by metal. We can see that from the mid first century AD to the really until the end of the second century AD, but running into the third, there's a lot of silver going out of the empire. Bronze runs gently through, and we have an interesting um, hot spot of gold at the end. But I'm going to be looking really at this period here, the period of the high empire. Um, the first question we can ask is, is this just normal? Is this what we find in the Roman Empire? And I mentioned outside because if I compare that with what happens in Alzai, which is a typical site within the Roman Empire, we can see the pattern of the coins we're finding is, is completely and utterly different. And so it's not just a question of coins 
drifting out of the Roman Empire into the Northern Barbaricum, but there are obviously some sort of mechanisms which are um, influencing the way coinage is moving around. The period I'd like to look at is the period where the Augustan uh, coins, uh, coinage system with gold, silver and bronze of different denominations was in existence running up to the, the middle of the second of the sorry of the third century AD. And what we can do is have a look at what coins of this coinage system are going out. So here we're looking at the different denominations of Roman coins that are leaving the Roman Empire in the first and second century AD. And this again, this area of Mecklenburg Vorpommern up on the Baltic coast, and we can see 75% of the coins are silver denarii going out. The gold is obviously quite rare. We don't find them often as coins, but the interesting thing is that there's not much of the smaller denominations. And this gets already starts to get quite interesting when we compare this to, an, to areas within the Roman Empire. This, um, here I've compared Mecklenburg Vorpommern, so the Barbaricum on the right, with an area um, on the Lower Rhine. So this is on the frontier of the Roman Empire. And this is some work done by uh, Joris Orts who divided the sites up into towns, small towns, rural settlements and villas, and then looked at the different uh, ratios between high value coins, aureus gold, and the lower value coins, for example, copper to pontius and ass. And what we see here is that in, in the towns, there's a lot of the smaller coins, and the further you go into the countryside, the, the fewer smaller coins you have, the more of the silver coins you have. This doesn't necessarily mean that the people in the countryside didn't have small change. Probably they did, but they actually lose it when they went to market in town. They, you lose coins when you're using them and you're not using them at home as much as you are when you go to market. So um, this, this difference in the proportions can perhaps be explained just by the way coins are being used rather than having them. But the point of this is it is completely different to what we see outside the empire. What we can, whoops. Um, what we can see here is that outside the empire, the smaller denominations, the copper denominations, the Cistercius, the Pontius and Ass are very rare. We're actually looking at a system where we have above all high value coins outside the empire. And what is interesting is these are the figures for all of northern Germany in my database, is that if we look at what I call the single finds, so these are just the individual coins, the stray finds that are picked up, and compare them with the hoards, the the silver coins are more likely to be found in hoards. And this suggests that coins are being used in a very, very different way outside the empire. We don't have small change, so we're not looking at exchange in the market or anything like that. And the fact that these coins are going into hoards suggests that their main or one of their main uses is as a storage of wealth. And so, so we're not necessarily looking at coins changing hands frequently, but we're looking at coins being saved, stockpiled in a very different way to how they use within the empire. And here, for example, a map put together by Arik Dimovsky um, with the help of um, a large number of colleagues, a simple map of hordes of denarii, hordes of these silver coins found outside the empire, and we find them stretching from, well, in fact, here we have them in Scotland as well, but, but from the North Sea right the way through to the Ukraine. These are quite a common, well, they're a very common feature of this area outside um, the empire. And if I come back to my area of Germany and look at the profile of these denarii, in, in the hordes, what we're finding is this huge number ranging from um, the Flavian emperors, so from Vespasian, 
through until basically um, the death of Commodus um, and um, uh, Septimius Severus coming to power, so the end of the second century AD. There is a, a, a very significant break with Septimius Severus, and this is something we'll look at in a minute. Now, one interesting point about these denarius hordes is that they can be very, very late. The denarii go out of circulation within the empire, 260, 270, they have almost completely disappeared from circulation within, within the empire. The Roman coinage system has changed and they are gone. But a hundred years later, we are still finding them in hordes outside the empire. And this is a very, very common phenomenon. Here, the horde from Lengerich in Lower Saxony in Northwest Germany. And on the left, we can see there's lots of uh, denarii here, but we're getting typical late Roman ornaments, this crossbow brooch here. And we have a coin of Magnentius, 350, AD 350, a hundred years or so after the denarii have disappeared from circulation within the empire. And this is not the only case. Latsen, another horde from the area. We have a large number of denarii, but also we have some late Roman silver. Again, here, this runs a little later um, into the um, um, 360s, 370s. So we can see that denarii are staying in use and in hordes at least 100 years after they've disappeared from within the empire. And it actually goes even later. And the classic example is the burial of the Frankish King Childerich, who was buried in AD 48, 481 in Belgium. And in his grave, there were a hundred, well, this was discovered, I think, in 1643, and it was all a little chaotic. Um, but we know that there were more than 100 gold coins and 200 silver coins in his grave. And we have documentation um, about the gold coins. They're all late Roman solidity. And we know of 42 silver coins, and they were mainly denarii. These coins, as I say, were about three to 400 years old at the time that Childerich was buried. So what we're seeing is that these coins, these silver coins, stay in use outside the Roman Empire for a very, very long time. They're being used in a very different way to how they're being used within the empire. And we can get a little bit theoretical. We can come to a, a concept um, uh, put together by uh, Karl Polanyi, who distinguishes between or distinguished between general purpose and special purpose money. And he says general purpose money serves up to five basic functions as a medium of exchange, a means of payment, a measure of value, and a unit of account, as well as a store of wealth. Or a special purpose money is limited to one or two functions and then only within certain spheres. And another point about general purpose money is that it allows conversion between spheres. Now, there's a very classic example um, that Polanyi, that, that um, ethnologists quote about the Tiv people of central Nigeria. This is a modern example. In the past, they used brass rods to buy cattle and to pay bride price. These rods were acquired by trade from the Sahara Desert, um, from from people trading across the Sahara Desert, who ultimately obtained them from the urbanized societies of North Africa. So they're coming from the north through the Sahara. And if a man could not acquire brass rods by trade or borrowing them, he would be prevented from acquiring cattle and getting married. So these brass rods are used just for this one purpose, basically, of acquiring cattle. And that's a classic example of general purpose money, uh, uh, sorry, special purpose money. And I think this is how we must see the Roman silver coins being used within the, um, within the, uh, within the, uh, whoops, sorry, I'm fiddling around with the display here, um, uh, within Germanic society. 
The coins are mainly being used as a storage of wealth, but probably also, as people see, for, for high level transactions between the elite, between um, it might be tribute, it might be, um, might be a dowry, uh, it can be diplomatic, um, diplomatic uh, gifts. It's not being used in the marketplace. After all, you can't buy a loaf of bread with a denarius. Um, so um, it's quite clearly being used in only a restricted number of spheres. It's special purpose money. Now, how then does this coin arrive in the, the barbaricum, in Germanic society? Now, this huge great peak of coin in the second century AD, and late first, second century AD, coincides really with um, the Marcomannic Wars of uh, Marcus uh, Aurelius on the Danube. And here on the right, um, a, a one of the reliefs from the column of Marcus Aurelius in Rome celebrating these wars. We can actually see within German Germanic society there was a reorientation of, of alliances. And the general interpretation is that now is that these coins leave the Roman Empire as payment to Germanic allies of Rome during these wars in order to secure alliances, to secure the frontier while Marcus Aurelius is busy um, on the Danube fighting the, fighting the Marcomanni. And this becomes quite interesting if we then um, start to look at the way all of these, this, these um, the, the profiles of the coins, because um, what happens is we can see here, both in, for example, in Mecklenburg Vorpommern and up on the Baltic, but also uh, throughout the Germ uh, Germanic Barbaricum, we can see that there is this cutoff of coins about 194. This actually coincides with the reduction in the silver content of the denarius from 68 to 40. 6% in 194 by Septimius Severus. And the old interpretation was that the Germani didn't like the bad coins. They just rejected them in trade. But today, as I've just mentioned, our interpretation is that these coins are going out of the empire, not by trade, but as, by, but as, as payment to Germanic allies the, to secure alliances with Rome. This is a targeted stream of coin. And this break in 194 also takes on a completely new, um, well, can be seen in a completely new light if we start to compare it with what's going on in the empire. Here I, I've drilled down a little looking at it in more detail. This is a situation on the Baltic coast with our break off date under Septimius Severus. And if I compare it with what's going on in the empire, here the coin series from Mainz, the capital of the upper German province on the Rhine, so the region from which a lot of coin will be leaving, we can see there's a really crass difference between, um, between the two situations. The moment where the silver drops off outside the empire here, coming down, is the moment it takes off Within, within the empire, suddenly we're getting more silver within the empire. So it's quite clear it's not just coin drifting out, there's something happening. What's also interesting is at the same time, bronze no longer comes in to the Northwest, into Mainz on the Rhine. So what's happening here? If we now start to look at what's happening outside the empire but with together with what's happening inside the empire, then this starts to make sense. As I've mentioned, Severus reduced the silver content of the denarius, but he did a lot of other things as well. He doubled army pay. He also, as we can see, suspended the supply of bronze to the Northwest, implying that the army is now being paid only in silver. They're not getting bronze anymore. So suddenly he needs a hell of a lot more silver than he had before. And the result is that he then seems to suspend payments to the Germani. 
coins are no longer going out of the empire. He's not paying for these alliances anymore. This would then seem to be part of internal German, uh, internal Roman um, financial politics and constraints and has nothing to do with trade or anything like that. But this has affects this decision. One thing we do see is that there are a lot of imitations of Roman coins outside the empire. In particular, we find them in the area today of the Ukraine, but they're found right the way across um, Northern Europe. This is a map put together by my Ukrainian colleague, Kirill Miskin. And on the left, you can see some examples of what these imitations could look like. It's also important to understand that they are, a lot of these imitations are made of very, very good quality silver, actually better than the silver being produced within the Roman Empire. But there are also plated coins, we can find them here. And there are also cast coins, these bottom ones here. Now this cast coin is made of extremely good silver, but some of them are made of um, a white metal. If you put 30% of tin, and 70% of bronze into the crucible, you actually get a white looking alloy. So some of the imitations are made of this white um, tinned bronze, but a lot of them are made extremely good silver. So what's happening here with these imitations? Now, the earliest date we have, the earliest archeological context we have for imitations of Roman denarii outside the empire comes from Illerup Ordal in Denmark, up in the Baltic. Um, there are four imitation denarii you can see here on the left, which actually they're all from the same pair of dies. Illerup Ordal, um, at Illerup Ordal, basically what happened was the possessions of a defeated war band were deposited in a bog. Um, and uh, here you can see, for example, in this image, it's the purse of a Germanic warrior that has been gone in the bog together with his possessions, his weapons, his comb. But also there is a shield in, or there are several shields in this deposit. Um, and we have dendrochronological dates. And the earliest date we have is AD 205. This is the earliest date we have for an imitation of a Roman denarius outside the empire. What is interesting is that these imitations are still being produced in the early fourth century. Now, I, I apologize for the quality, uh, the resolution of um, this image, but it's the best one I have. It, this is interesting because we have here a denarius of Lucius Verus from the mid second century AD, and the reverse is dilinked with an aureus of Diocletian from about AD 300, which means that they are still producing imitations of denarii, in this case, probably in the Ukraine, it's the Goths, in the early fourth century. So we have this, this um, episode of imitations going on from maybe AD 200, at least to AD 300. And this fits in very well with the, what we know about silver being used for such a long time outside the empire. And my, I would like to suggest that what we're seeing here is a reaction to the suspension of payments to allies by Septimius Severus. They want silver, they've got used to it. There's a high demand for silver coins north of the frontier, so they start to imitate Roman denarii. I'm not sure you can really call them imitations. It's actually a Germanic coinage, but they're copying, they're being inspired by Roman iconography. So kind of summing up, um, suggests the payment of large numbers of denarii is subsidies to the Germani in the second half of the second century AD during the Marcomannic Wars and afterwards, led to the development of a system of storage and circulation of wealth that made use of Roman denarii. So we have a system of, of special purpose money based on Roman denarii. 
and the system was sufficiently well established and stable to trigger the production of imitation denarii, at least until the early fourth century. We should also note that the Germani minted their own coins, but they did not develop their own iconography. They copied Roman iconography. It changed, of course, later on when we get to the Bracteates, then we do start to get original Germanic, Germanic iconography. But as far as these imitations are concerned, that is not what is happening. And we can also say that the flow of coins was mainly controlled by Rome. We have this outflow in the second half of the second century AD being deliberately cut off by Septimius Severus. And we can say that these coins served a special purpose money with a limited range of functions. So that my overview of what's happening in the Germanic world. And I'd now like to go back four or five centuries and look at what happened in the Celtic world and their contacts with the Mediterranean. The, the world of Celtic numismatics is full of wonders. It's an incredible range of different coinages that we, that we see, and I'm not going to go into all of it. I'm going to focus on just a couple of regions. But what we do have is coinages that have their roots in Mediterranean prototypes from a whole range of areas, from the colonies of the Greek colonies of Emporion and Rhoda, to the coins of the Macedonian um, kingdom. All sorts of different coinages are, are, are serving as inspiration initially for Celtic coinages. Um, but where and when did the Celts first encounter coinage? How did, how did this all get going? Now, in areas bordering coin using areas of the Mediterranean world, it would seem to be through contact with um, nearby communities. For example, imitations of drowns of Rhoda start very early and they're found mainly in the south of France near to Rhoda. Rhoda would actually be just off the map down here. The coins themselves, this is a fairly good early imitation. Um, are based on the, 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 the badge of the, the, of the city of Rhoda. Rhoda means rose. And what we actually see here is a rose, but it's viewed from beneath. So we actually have the stem and the thorny bit around it and the petals seen from beneath. This is, um, and this is then taken up by um, the inhabitants of the south of France, who then develop um, a coinage which goes on to look very different. But interesting point, um, we're not quite sure why there are so many up here, but we think it may be related to the, the trade in tin uh, with, in, um, in Cornwall um, with Southwest Britain, that this may be a, a, um, a, a, a staging post for the trade uh, going up there. But, but anyway, here we can basically see a coinage which um, comes from uh, be basically being just very close to coin using people and, 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 and joining the community, so to speak. But there are other coinages where we can't say that. For example, the imitations of status of Philip of Macedon, of the father of Alexander the Great, um, well, celebrating him. They are found just, as we can see here on the right, spread widely across Gaul and through into, into Britain. There's no question of them being um, coming, that we're looking at a, of them on the borders of an area using these gold coins, and, and, and it's through exchange on the border that these coins are now coming into Gaul and um, inspiring coinage. There must be something else that is uh, triggering the production of imitations of these status of Philip. And here we come to the picture on my, um, um, my uh, on the title of my 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 paper, the idea of chiefs and mercenaries. Now, 
Um, the Celts enter the Mediterranean world as, um, as warriors, as war bands. Um, 387, Brennus and the Senones, they defeat the Romans, they sack Rome. We have the famous um, episode of the geese waking the Romans up in the middle of the night as the Gauls try to storm the capital. And it's thanks to the geese that the, 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 that the capital is not taken that, and that Rome survives. And a hundred years later, another Brennus invaded Greece. He got to Delphi, plunders Delphi, but was defeated and died shortly afterwards. So the, the Celts come in as attacking warriors, but the Mediterranean kingdoms then um, start to use them as mercenaries and in a very, very big way. There's hardly a war in the Hellenistic world that doesn't involve um, Celtic mercenaries. For example, they're fighting in the wars of Carthage against the Greeks in Sicily. And we have one um, source which tells us gives us some interesting detail of how this works. Perseus, the last Macedonian king um, in his campaign against Rome, decides to hire some Celts, the Bastani from the Danube. Um, he's going, he wants a thousand cavalry and 10,000 infantry, and he agrees to pay 10 staters for each of the cavalry, five for each of the infantry, and a thousand for their king, Thaudicus. In the end, actually, he's too miserly to pay the money, and the, and the um, and um, he never gets gets the Celts. But this is an idea of the amount of money being used and how this whole thing works. The, these mercenaries are getting a large amount of gold, and um, so we can probably see them coming back home with coins and then deciding, okay, this this works out well. And so someone, well, the equivalent of Claudicus comes back home, has seen how it works in the Mediterranean and starts to produce coinage himself in order to do the same thing as the Hellenistic uh, kings. He's, he will be using coins in order to ensure that he has a retinue, he has an army um, of his own. So this is another way, other than contacts with, with communities using coin, another way that the Celts will come to use coin. I think an important thing is to understand is that coins are not being used in trade, not in long distance trade. Diodorus Siculus tells this wonderful story. The Romans think it's cool. They go to Gaul with a barrel of wine, with an amphora of wine and come back with a, a slave. Now they think this is a great exchange. A, 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 an amphora of wine for a slave because they've got so much wine and they need slaves. The Gauls think this is cool. Um, they don't have wine, but if they want if they want some slaves, they just raid the next village, and they've got them. So it's an exchange that works well for in both ways. And this is an important thing about trade. You want to make a profit on each of your journeys, and you don't take coin and pay because. If you do that, you're not actually um, you're not making a profit on your journey out if you're only transporting, if you're only taking coin as your price. So um, trade generally works with thing, with goods going in both directions. And I think this is a good example of we can see how see that that coinage is not coming in uh, by trade. What we do see, however, is, um, is how trade can trigger um, social uh, developments that which can lead then to the, to the production of coinage. For example, we're looking here at Moravia. So um, if I just come up here, it's this bit of the map marked up here on, in red. This is on the amber route. So, Amber is coming from the Baltic and it comes down this route down to Aquileia at the head of the Adriatic. We know a lot about this trade. And what happens is that in the third century BC, a lot of kind of early towns develop on this route in Moravia and they start to produce a great deal of coinage. 
but this coinage is not being used in trade. It's the fact that the trade um, triggers the development of these settlements that leads to the production of coinage rather than um, the trade itself. And it has to be said, even a, a 124th stator weighing sort of half a half a gram is still a valuable piece of metal. It's nothing that, that can be used for small exchanges, high value coinage. Um, and here's some more examples of what these coinages can look like. Uh, but the point is we're still looking here at very high value coins. And this is a point I'd like to stress in the next slides. Marked here in blue is the area that um, I've just shown you on the Amber, Amber Road going up north to the, the Baltic. Uh, this is a map that Enrico Iria and colleagues put together. White is areas with silver coinage. Um, black is, um, is gold coinage. We're going to move now across here to this area, which is based on, on on gold coinage. And we'll be looking at basically uh, two different uh, groups of coinage. Well, I'll, I'll start by looking at two different groups of coinage. Blue, coins that imitate coins of Alexander of Macedon, uh, so Alexander the Great, and red, coins that imitate coins actually struck by Alexander, but in his father's name. Um, and here, what these two coins look like. On the left, the, the Philip status, which we just saw. And on the right, the, uh, an imitation of an Athena Alkis um, uh, stator. These are coins being produced from about 300 BC. Initially, the very earliest coins look very much like the Greek originals. Some of them are very different, difficult to distinguish from Greek originals. But we are looking at coins which actually which will weigh eight grams or more. These are very high value coins. With time, we get smaller units coming in. And I'm now looking at the area of Gaul, the area of modern France and Britain and Southwest Germany. Uh, uh, but until 150 BC, so for the first 150 years of coinage in this area, we only find gold. We get status and we get quarter status, so it's coins that weigh a little more than two grams. But we're still looking at high value coins. This is an important point. We only have high, very high value coins in circulation. We also find them going into hordes a very great deal. Um, the interpretation of these hordes is a little difficult. There's always this traditional view that hordes are buried in an emergency because some, yeah, some barbarians are coming over the pass, so you bury your, 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 your goodies as fast as you can. But these days, particularly with these, these Celtic hordes, we're tending to look at them in, a, in terms of ritual uh, deposition as as deposits for the gods. We find the coins often together with with talks, with these large um, neck rings and other items of jewelry. The classic examples are the Snethersum hoards from Britain, although we do have, as you can see in some time on the right, hoards just of gold coins. So no, this reminds us a little bit of the Germans with their silver going into hoards. But whereas they're using it as a storage of wealth, here we're kind of seeing, um, um, yeah, deposits for the gods. But these hoards are also very interesting because they tell us a lot about how coin is being used by the Celts at this time. As I say, these are very high value coins. Now, Michel and Nick has done a lot of work and looked at the, um, and plotted the die links between hoards. Each line represents a die link a, between two hordes. But it's not just individual coins that we're finding, it's whole groups of coins. It could be 10 or 12 coins that are die linked between two hordes. And what this shows is the coins are not moving individually, but they're tending to move in groups. So we're looking at very high level, high value transactions here. 
What it also means is that the coins are not moving very fast, because if transactions are taking place frequently, then these groups should get split up, but they're not getting split up. So we're, we're looking here at these hordes of high value um, exchange taking place um, infrequently. So we are not looking at commercial transactions or anything like that, but what we are surely looking at here is exchange between elite groups at the highest level of society. Um, again, tribute, dowries, diplomatic uh, gifts, um, whatever. But we're not looking at, at a kind of a, a real monetary economy. This is really high value, high level exchange. But from the mid second century BC, this starts to change. And this is the time when we start to see the Oppida, these Celtic early towns, which develop um, here a nice reconstruction of how we how we should imagine these uh, these settlements. Um, and, and behind that, a, a map of their distribution, which we'll we'll look at a little bit in a while. And at the same time as the Oppida appear, we now start to find in this region not just gold, but we find silver. Um, we call them quinari and obols after Mediterranean um, coinages, but we don't know what they were actually called in the ancient world. But these obols, they can weigh like one, one and a bit grams, so it could be quite small coins, but they're coming in from the mid second century BC as the obida start to appear. So urban context, coins, um, a bit like we saw on the Amber Corridor. But we're not just getting silver, we're also getting potin. Now, potin is an interesting Celtic or Gaulish, Gallic um, innovation. These coins are cast and they're made of a tin bronze, rather like the imitation Germanic um, coins I mentioned earlier on. Um, one of the reasons for using a tin bronze is it has a lower melting point. It's much better suited to casting than pure copper or normal bronze. It also means that these coins will have looked silvery initially. They will not have looked like bronze or copper. They will have been very silvery. But here we're looking at now low value coinage, low denominations looking at something that we can perhaps interpret as small change appearing in these early urban contexts. Um, Potin coinage is very interesting because it's cast, um, probably cast mainly using sand. Um, I don't know if anyone has seen pewter being cast, for example. Um, uh, you make molds out of sand very easily. Um, you can cast in large numbers, but the idea is basically you make a mold, you press coins into the, into the sand. Um, here we actually have um, a, a mold made of bronze, very rare, but you press the coins in, into the sand um, and then you cut a channel through and you pour the metal in here, let it cool, take it apart. And with the result that the coins have these sort of lugs, well, sometimes it can be a proper lug, sometimes a, just a flat end, where the coins get broken off after they've been cast and separated. The reason I show this is because this is a Celtic innovation. This is something they develop themselves. This is not a common method of producing coins in the Mediterranean world. This is a, a Celtic innovation. And these Potin coins, this small change, is quite clearly related to the Oppida, not that it just appears at the same time as the Oppida, but the distribution um, is the same. Here on the left, this map of the distribution of Oppida, uh, and I've marked in red the area in the map on the right, and we can see here there's this cutoff point running through here, and it's the same cutoff point we see here. So these small coins are quite clearly related to these early urban settlements. An interesting point, the Germans don't have small change, but they don't have urban settlements 
either. We're starting to see differences between the two um, societies. And from the mid first century, we then actually start to get struck bronze coins. Um, these are small coins weighing maybe only two grams. They're produced in huge numbers. This is after Caesar has conquered Gaul. And interestingly, we start to see a lot of Roman influences. I mean, this looks like a very, very Roman um, die. Um, and there's a suggestion sometimes they are getting given dies by the Romans. Um, and these coins tend to have a very local distribution. For example, we know that this coinage on the left, the, with a legend Arda, um, were probably very probably produced at the Titelberg. And one person was actually buried um, with a punch for making dies uh, um, in, uh, in, their, in their grave. So this, is, this punch will have been used to make dies in order to strike these coins. So what we're seeing is we're coming through um, the period um, into the Roman Empire in Gaul, where we're going from high level, high value gold, coming into an early urban society, which then sees the development of small change and results in very complex trimetallic systems where we have gold, silver and bronze, bronze in two forms, cast and struck. And what we also get is very, very varied iconography. The, the range is enormous, completely different um, ideas. And just to give you one idea of how this all works, I'd like to look at this coin type here, because this coin, the Celtic one at the bottom, is actually derived from this Roman denarius at the top. Now, which is quite nice because it actually gives us a date a po a, and terminus postquem for this Celtic coin. You won't believe me until I show you these intermediate types. Now, the Roman denarius struck with the legend Servelli, Servelius. Um, we find an intermediate type with the Roma head on the obverse, and you can see the legend down here, coming through here. Um, there's other types that don't have the legend, but what's happened? The Roman soldier with the shield has been taken and has been reinterpreted in a Celtic context to what we call the bird man. So with a sort of bird's tail, um, I mean, as it could be evening dress, but um, a bird's tail, so we call it the bird man. And the shield has become something archetypally Celtic. It's become a talk. It's become one of those neck rings that we saw in the hordes. So what we're seeing, a contrast with the Germans who basically just copy Roman um, iconography, the Celts are taking Mediterranean iconography and completely reinterpreting it within their own visual um, imagery and, and, and context of beliefs. So to start to, to sum up the differences between the two, comparing the two, we can say that the Celts are in innovative. Um, for example, Potin, a new idea how to make coins, but also in the iconography, whereas the Germans are imitative rather than imitative. They're, um, in innovative. They're just copying the Roman stuff. The Celts have complex multi-metallic systems. The Germans are sticking to a simple system based on silver. And again, we have this difference in the iconography complex and simple. It's not quite as black and white as that, because something interesting happens if you actually start looking at the, well, I call it the periphery here because it's the periphery of Gaul running along the River Rhine, but it's really kind of an interface between the two um, societies. Julius Caesar says that the Rhine was the border between the Celts and the Germans, but it was not as simple as that. It's very mixed. And there's a lot of movement taking place. Now, um, this coin type, the Triskeles status, because um, we have the Triskeles on the, on the obverse. Now, they start off here in Hess. Uh, Frankfurt is here, for those of you who know that I mean, this, I'm sitting here. Um, uh, it starts off here as gold coins, 
But as, as the, um, there's a sort of gradual debasement of the metal, it goes through stages of silver down into bronze. This is a chronological development, but also at the same time, things move. So the silver and the bronze is found on the lower Rhine here. So we have a change through time and through space that coincides with a, a gradual reduction in the quality or the, of the, or the nature, perhaps better, of the metal. And this also happens with another type known as the dancing man type, which also moves from, done it again, which moves from this area here um, where the Triskel estate has started. Um, at, it sort of actually does a bit of a, a bit of a curve up here onto the liver, liver first, but the latest coins are found um, down here. We have this development through time. Um, in this case, the iconography, I think we have to say deteriorates, um, unlike the Triskel status, which stayed very stable. And the quality or the fineness of the silver drops from like, oh, well, I think we're looking at about 80, 90% up here. And down here, we're really only looking at 20% uh, of silver. So something very much like what we see for the Triskel estate as it's, everything's moving. Um, the, 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 the fineness of the metal is deteriorating, but the iconography is staying um, or the type is staying the same, the type is static. Um, we can actually um, connect this with historical um, events as well. For example, the Batavians who would settle on the, on the Lower Rhine during the Roman Empire said that they were actually a splinter group of the Cati who we know were here. So that seems to fit very nicely with this move. And we also know that the Ubii from this area here were moved by Agrippa during the reign of Augustus to the area around Cologne, which also coincides with, very nicely with the move of the silver coin. So we can associate this, this movement um, um, with political events and associate it with the, um, with the, um, with this gradual uh, change in the coinage. But the point is that the the iconography stays static so that this periphery, or as I say, I should perhaps say interface, um, uh, sits in between the two very nicely. We have in Central Gaul, North Gaul, we have this complex trimetallic coinages with varied iconography. In the Germans, we have this monometallic coinage with imitative on, um, iconography. And in between, we have this sort of mix. It's a mo it's they have different metals, but they follow on after each other, and the iconography say, stays static. So, um, actually, in terms of um, not only in terms of uh, of space, but also in terms of time, this this interface sits very nicely between these two um, situations. So, to finally, ah, yeah, no, before I forget. Um, I talk mainly about um, silver coin with the with the Germans with the Germani. Gold coins, interestingly, are used very differently in the Germanic world. A huge number of them are pierced, and they are almost always pierced so that the hole is above the emperor's head. And Kirill Mizgin has actually done some nice statistics on this and you can see um, there's quite clearly a preference for these to be pierced so that if you put them on a chain and wear them here the emperor's head will be visible and the orientation of the reverse can be completely different this is also what we find with these um, very late roman medal medallions which um, leave the empire um, as diplomatic uh, gifts to secure alliances with groups outside the empire. And once they've left the empire, they tend to be given either loops or frames. These are quite clearly, we know these are Germanic um, 
um, uh, works. Um, this is not what the Romans are giving out. They're giving out the medallion. The Germans are then mounting them so that they too get worn with the head of the emperor. Interestingly, we have a whole series of imitations of these, of gold coins, plated imitations. Um, well, gold plated. And there's a whole group of them where if you actually look where the hole is on these die link coins, this, the hole is actually in the die. They're actually being produced with the hole in there when they are, when, when they're struck. The die seems to punch a hole in in the in in the coins uh, this means that gold is being used in a very different way to silver in germanic society obviously it's valuable and can be used as a store of wealth but it's also a mark of prestige it's something you wear it's something you display these are prestige goods um you very rarely find at least during the period of the roman empire silver coins pierced in this way Silver is for wealth and gold is for prestige. I mean, it's not as black and white as that really, but there are quite clearly differences they use. So anyway, to sum up, let's look at the differences between the two. For the Germani, for the Germans, we can see there's this controlled flow of coins leaving the empire. It is steered by Rome. It's the silver in the second century AD, and it's the gold medallions in the second half of the fourth and in the early fifth century that are going out. In the Celtic world, and this is something I haven't really talked about, there's actually very little Roman coin, for example, coming into Gaul uh, until Augustus even. Um, a completely different situation. The societies are rather different. With the Germani, we're just looking at a martial elite. We're looking at a warrior society without urban centers, whereas in the Celts we have these martial elites. They were warriors too, fearsome warriors, but we also have early urban centers. For the Germani, it's, we're talking about clearly about special purpose money, whether it's silver or gold. It has a limited range of uses. The Celtic world, as we come in to the late period when Rome is now, well, for example, um, after Caesar's conquest of Gaul, when the, we're getting lots of bronze coin being produced, we must be moving into a situation where we're getting a kind of monetized economy and we're starting to get into the idea of general purpose money. The Germani are very conservative in what they do with coins. They just imitate Roman denarii or Roman gold coins. Um, whereas the Celts get in innovative, they start, for example, they, they produce potin, something very new. The Germani have this simple silver system. The Celts have this complex multi-metallic system. Oh, this is good. I can see in, in translating from German, I've made a few typing up, typos on this one. Apologies for that. The Germani have this simple imitative uh, iconography. The Celts have complex iconography and the Germani are using the gold, for example, as ornaments or badges, because actually this idea of wearing the head of the emperor um, is an interesting concept. And we don't really understand quite why. Are they trying to protect, to present themselves as friends of Rome or are they, they have the head of the defeated enemy? A lot of these Germanic warriors would actually have served in the Roman Empire. That's a, a bit of a puzzle for us, but that would be a topic for another um, another paper. So um, we can see two very, very different reactions to the way um, this interaction between the northern societies and the Mediterranean world can take place. So thank you very much. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, David. That was a great lecture. And thanks for bringing up the question of the gold um, at the end. You know, I find that interesting. And we, we had uh, Kirill give a long table a, a few months ago. Um, where he talked a bit about the gold. Uh, one question I have is um, with regard to, you focused a lot uh, on Germany uh, in the Mecklenburg four Pullman area. Um, yeah. And that, that silver that you have after 194, uh, with regard to the, um, 
more eastern part of the barbaricum, like Poland and Ukraine. Uh, I know a lot of the research I've read lately talks about the gold coinage. Are you seeing as much silver there as you are in Germany, or is, do they really have a preference oh, oh. for the gold? No, there is a massive amount of silver in Ukraine. Okay. Um, the gold, the gold is interesting. Um, uh, partly because of the work Alexander Bush has done identifying this reuse of dyes for provincial Roman um, mm -hmm. Roman uh, bronze being reused by the Goths in the Ukraine to produce gold. I mean that was a that was an amazing. Um, I mean, amazing how he spotted that. Um, um, you can build a very good story around the gold, and in, as, as you will know, in trade now the um, the Aurum Barbaricum um, is yeah is is um, is figuring uh, big in trade. So there's a lot of work on the gold, but there's masses of silver, absolutely masses of it, um, and it's probably where the silver, a lot of the silver imitations are being produced. Uh, if you look at these imitations, and it, I mean, I showed that map, you could see this huge concentration in the Ukraine. What you can see is the Goths, um, you can actually see the power of the Goths uh, um, as, a, as a grouping in, in these imitations there. They're making so there is a, a massive amount of silver. I worked on. I, I concentrate on Mecklenburg Vorpommern because that's where I have the most up-to-date um, information. I work on the coins from there myself, um, and we're getting some fascinating new uh, material. I think I have a place where they're actually breaking up Roman silverware in order to cast imitations, for example, but sure. um, can't can't quite prove it yet. Cool. All right. Well, are there any other questions for, for David? I do see one in the chat. Uh, for the minority, it says, thank you, great talk. For the majority of gold coins not pierced at 12 o'clock to align with the head of the emperor, was the piercing oriented relative to the reverse design? Um, no, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Um... Quite what they're quite what they're doing with that. Um, I really, really couldn't say. And we, the trouble is, we don't know how these coins are being suspended or whether they're being nailed to something. And the orientation uh, coming out of that might play a role. But basically, no. Um, there, there's no indication that they they're doing it uh, orienting on the on the reverse design. Um, but. Quite white skewed, hard to say. Okay. 